Hey guys, this is Navinod with part two of my TTAC series, the Dow of Seabedding. Uh, we're going to start with an overview, talk a little bit about what we talked about, and then we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about, which is when not to seabed. Uh, in the first video, we talked about the reasons why it makes sense to make a continuation bet. We actually asked the question, does it make sense to default seabed when checked to? as pre-flop razor and we asked the question does it make sense to default check to the razor and we we looked at the reasons that people do it or did it and why it's kind of stood the test of time and we examined it that way and I think we sort of implied in that first video that we'd be getting into the why nots of seabedding and really that's what this video series is going to be about it's going to be about getting you to think about why you're doing what you're doing and when you should maybe be doing something other than what you're doing and we'll take a look at some examples and then I'll just wrap it up. So the basics. As we talked about in the first video, pre-flop razor just always has a lot of reasons to bet flops. I mean, there's almost always some reason to make a bet. If you are Chuck 2 and I'm talking about we're on the flop, we raised pre-flop, got called by one player, we're in position, we get Chuck 2. There's a lot of reasons to bet on that flop. We can be bluffing, hoping to fold out a better hand. We can be value betting hoping that it just looks like a standard C bet and we get called by ORS. And there is value in denying our opponent their share of their equity. Not allowing them to realize their equity is a good thing for us, bad for them. And that's a little bit uh, something that people kind of like to debate a little bit. But I don't think it's debatable. I think it's just a fact. I think, you know, really in the overall world of poker players, I believe there are two camps on this. And I think that mostly mostly there's two camps and most of the players fall into one of these two camps either they don't think that it's a very big deal at all to give opponents free cards and then there's the other camp where they just think it's the end of the world to give a free card and i think that the actuality of it and what we're going to be looking at in this video and really video series is that it is a mistake but it's still good and profitable if we can get our opponent to make bigger mistakes in exchange for our smaller mistake and if we can avoid making bigger mistakes in the hand ourselves so yeah pre-flop razor has a ton of reasons to bet a lot of flops and that actually is the reason in a roundabout way that pre-flop caller has very little incentive to do anything but check to the pre-flop razor and i think it is awesome when our opponent can make a lot of mistakes against every single bet we make Sometimes they're not going to be able to make mistakes, and we have to decide whether it makes sense for us to check back or to see bet in a situation, for instance, when we are probably going to have the best hand a lot, uh, but we don't really see a lot of uh, a lot of value in betting it. So, are the only reasons, and I'm asking this question, are the only reasons to see bet betting for value, hoping to call by worse? Betting as a bluff, hoping that better hands will fold at some point between now and the river. Only. Is that it? Is that strict? And I would say the answer is no, not exactly. There are these two governing forces in the, quote, game space of no limit hold on poker strategy. And they are the fundamental theorem of poker and game theory optimal. And if we don't make continuation bets on the flop often enough, we're making, really, a lot of times we're making mistakes in both. GTO and the FTOP, the Fundamental Theorem. And that means what? Um, well, I think that at default, we should be making a continuation bet on the flop, heads up in position when checked to, by pre-flop caller, a very large percent of the time. But I don't think we should be doing it like 90 or 100% of the time. We should be thinking in terms of why should I not see about the flop? And if we can't think of any good reasons, then we should be see about in the flop. I, I really think that you could do a lot worse than to see about 100% of the time. I mean, you could do a lot, lot, lot better. That's what this video series is about. But I think if you just really can't think of, well, I don't know, I maybe should, maybe shouldn't, then probably just put in like a half pot, see about how bad could it be? It's only got to get through a third of the time, right? Uh, so, begging the question, why not see that? I've already said that we could probably see that 90% of the time and it wouldn't be terrible. Then, what are the reasons not to see that? Because we need compelling reasons to not see that. 
what might they look like and some of the reasons to not make a continuation bet on the flop if and, and I, I know this is uh, uh, confusing for some people but this is really the way we need to start thinking about our lines if villain will make more mistakes against a check back than against a bet why on earth will we bet right uh, so if we believe that we can induce more mistakes by checking back than we can see betting then that's a good reason to see to check back now I think people could look at that as me telling him it's okay to slow play big hands when I'm not really saying that uh, I check back some hands but I very rarely check back like top set you know I mean this isn't I'm not saying we should be checking back our huge monster value hands hoping that our opponent is gonna uh, decide that we have nothing and just go off with like second pair or whatever we're not I'm not suggesting that I'm just saying sometimes you have a hand that it's kinda hard for your opponent to make a lot of mistakes against uh, if you bet but if you check back maybe it's not gonna be so hard uh, so if there are not, and here's what it comes down to, if there's really not going to be a lot of good second best hands in your opponent's range that you can get value from, then you're not really value betting, I mean, in a sense. Our hand is, um, this is another reason that we would not see bet, that we might skip the see bet, that our hand is not really worried about free cards or giving our opponent a free roll to whatever equity they have. Uh, and if we don't, this is the big one, or I guess you could call it the big two, but these are the big massive major reasons that you'd even consider checking back most of the time. We don't think our hand is strong enough to value bet, and we don't think our hand is weak enough to bluff. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. That's the primary. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is a, a piece of the overall puzzle, but that's the big one. So, for example... Let's say that I open raise king 10 suited from the cutoff and we're playing six max. And I get called by the player in the small blind who's been playing pretty decent. He seems like uh, he knows what he's doing to a degree. The flop comes out ace, king, two, rainbow. And villain checks to us. What should we do? Um, do we see bet? And if we see bet, why are we see betting? And I'm not just saying, you know, what do we do? Should I, I'm really literally asking you. If you have to, pause the video, take a second, think about this. This is important. Why are we betting? Or, I'm not saying, like, why would we see bet? Like, that's stupid. Why see? I'm, I'm literally asking the question, why would we see bet? Let's really, let's actually do this. Let's do a list of pros and cons. Uh, remember, we have king 10. Let's just say the suited is in hearts, so it doesn't, come in, it doesn't come into play. We get to the flop of ace, king 2, in position against a decent player who flat called pre-flop from the blinds and we are in late position. What are the pros and what are the cons of C batting here? Well we've got you know second pair with a mediocre kicker. Uh, the pros would be if our opponent has a hand like a gutter ball straight draw which sure, surely would be in his range if he's decent and he's calling out of the big blind it's definitely not impossible for him to have some gutter balls here. Uh, we don't give him free cards. Uh, we don't, and, and he could even, um, you know, he could have like a just a little piece, or or even just like a pair. And there is value in not letting our opponent just bink four outers or bink two outers against us, or even five outers. So we don't give free cards. Uh, that's a pro for c betting. We keep a strong c bet percent, and that's a good thing. Having a good c bet percentage is a good thing. If we really go in and polarize our c-betting percentages, uh, I mean if we really just cut our range into like three chunks, air that we see bet, value hands that we see bet, everything else that we check back, I think that's going to be okay in the short run. In fact, it's my standard, it's my default most of the time, but don't doubt that that's, uh, don't doubt for a second that that's exploitable. That's super exploitable. When I see an opponent, I play a lot of heads up games. When I watch an opponent do that a couple times, I see a couple hands go to showdown and I see what he's doing. But he's going to have a real hard time from that point forward. So never think that just because this seems like such a good idea that it can't be exploited. Just about anything can be exploited. If you're not playing GTO, you can be exploited. So... Uh, another pro as to why we might want to bet the, the hand here is because we're going to be c-betting a lot and here we likely do have the best hand and we want to find out if we don't, right? So a lot of players would just c-bet this flop 
uh, for information. And I don't think that's a good reason to see that, but it's, you know, there's got to be some, some value to it, and there is value in it. I think the biggest value is not so much to find out whether or not your opponent has an ace, which I think is why most players would just mindlessly see that. I think the bigger thing is that if we do check back, what are we going to do when we face aggression, which we almost surely will, on later streets? When he barrels, you know, the turn and river, we're really going to have a tough, we're going to have a, a tough decision to make. So those are the, 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 the pros are, you know, stop him from sucking out on us for free. Keep a good CBAT percentage up, and that makes it less profitable for your opponent to call you uh, with hands pre-flop because if he's, you know, if you're not CBATing, just let's take it to an extreme and say you literally never bet the flop. If you never bet the flop, then I'm going to call you a lot wider out of the big blind because I know I can profitably because I'm not looking at three cards, I'm looking at four cards. So whatever your yeah, probably if you say had like a two and a half times the big blind raise sizing, if you have a high C bet percentage versus a low C bet percentage, I mean I might cut out a lot or it might change a lot of the hands I will or won't decide to call with pre flop. I mean if if I know you're gonna be checking back a ton, I can play like anything that's even marginally suited and or connecting, right? Um anyway, so there are some pros. We don't get lost in hand as often. Uh, we keep it simple. We don't get free cards. We keep our percentages in line. It looks normal, you know. Uh, maybe we get to this flop of ace king two. We have king ten. Our opponent is a game theory expert and a professional hand reader. He's just really, really good at poker. And when we check back, he either just knows exactly what we have. He, he just puts us on exactly like a mediocre king. Uh, and really can make life complicated for us or not make any mistakes against us and do things like check raise the, the turn or just really over bet the turn and then you know jam the river which is going to put us in a really ugly awkward spot uh, so I guess if well let's look at the cons and then I'll, I'll tell you what I do the cons are we very rarely get called by worse like we're in late position opening in a six max table and we're probably going to have a lot of aces in our range. Not only are we going to be perceived as having a lot of ace x hands, but we really literally will have a lot of ace x hands. So when we see bet this, are we really see betting for value? Because if we're see betting for value, it's kind of like we're over representing our value hand. Anytime you're about to take an action that over represents a value hand or a decent valued hand, you really need to stop and consider whether you're doing something wrong or not. The villain's probably just never going to fold a better hand when we see that here. So the value that we have in our second pair with a decent kicker is just wasted. It's out the door. If we're going to see that this spot, then I think that we may as well not even look at our hand. And if we're going to see that, this is maybe the worst hand, in my opinion, that we could make a continuation bet with on this ace king deuce flop king 10 is probably the worst if you're ever going to check a hand back on that flop then this would be the time to do it uh it not only is it unlikely to make us money but it could get us raised if we get check raised here we're probably just gonna have to fold and be done with the hand and now not only did we not get value or fold out a better hand we lost the pot we could have got the showdown in one with things to think about right that's these are the things to think about now the big main premise and, and this surely has got to be our default consideration when thinking about c betting the flop or checking it back can we be called by worse will we fold out better and i mean of course on this street right here right now but i also mean moving forward in the hand we do have to be forward thinking we have to think about what cards can come on turns and rivers What's that going to do for our perceived range, our opponent's range, and what it's going to do to our actual hand equity, uh, the equity distributions, fold equity. Our, you know, There's a lot of things to consider down the road, but it has to start with this. If I'm bluffing, am I getting enough folds here or not? And if I'm value betting, am I going to have the best hand at least, well, greater than half the time when I'm called? So that's the default consideration that's the primary everything else is secondary a villain is not going to be making a ton of mistakes 
against our bets, then how are we going to be profiting? If, if our opponent is not making mistakes, then we're really not making money, right? Um, now, here's the other end of the coin, and I don't think... I've never heard anybody talk about this, but I think it's huge. And I'm just going to put this big, fat... However, if we decide, if we have to make a decision between allowing our opponent to make a perfect fold or making a mistake ourselves, is it really as clear cut as it sounds? There's a lot of factors that need to be weighed out here in this decision to see bet or not see bet, even when it seems unlikely that our opponent is going to be able to make a lot of mistakes against our bet. If our opponent's drawing live against us and we don't bet, then we're making a mistake. That mistake costs money, and it's got to be one of the factors that we weigh. So is it really clear-cut, super straightforward? No, I don't think it is. I think we've got to weigh a lot of factors, even before doing something as, quote, simple or, quote, standard, as checking back a hand that's too strong to bluff and not strong enough to value bet with. The hand factors that will come into play are, um, will villain make a lot of betting mistakes on the turn? That's part one. Part two is, can I call him if he does? You know, so I've got this hand where I don't feel like it's weak enough that I should be bluffing with it. I don't think it's strong enough that I can bet and be called by worse, so I can't really value bet it. So then maybe I should just check back. But why are we checking back? We have to have a reason. Remember, in the absence of any reason, uh, a clear-cut, good, definitive reason, to check back rather than see bet, we probably ought to be default see betting. So if we don't have a pretty good plan here, then we shouldn't be checking back on the flop. So when we are pre-flop raiser, we get called, we go to the flop, in position, heads up, villain checks. Will villain make a lot of betting mistakes on the turn if I check back? Like, is he going to bluff with his entire range just because I under up my hand? If so, that could be fantastic, as long as, I, as long as I have a hand that's strong enough to call, at least on the turn. So the other considerations would be, uh, will our opponent call down lighter once I underwrap my hand? And, and I think one of these two, at least, and very often both of these two, uh, will be uh, in the affirmative. I mean, I think very often when we check back the flop as pre-flop raiser, we're going to get let into on the turn and I think a lot of players in today's game what we're going to be looking at is once we check back the ace high flop we're going to be looking at a turn bet and very often we're either going to see a check call on the river or we're going to see a another barrel on the river and the other thing is is if our opponent has some kind of hand like maybe a pair of like sixes or something maybe our opponent will check again on the turn, just trying to get their hand to showdown, and we can now actually start betting for value. So, you know, if I, but if my hand's not even strong enough to value bet once my opponent has checked twice, then again we have to go back and reevaluate and say, maybe I should have just c-bet this on the, on the flop. Maybe I should have made life complex for no gain. There's always going to be a downside to checking back. So we need to make sure there's enough upside to justify it, to balance it out, and then some. And the other thing is, how often is our opponent going to suck out with a hand that he would have folded to a C-bet? Don't think that doesn't mean anything, but don't think it's everything. It's something. What do future streets likely do for and or against me? Um, so, will villain make a lot of betting mistakes? If so, great, check back, induce, induce those betting mistakes. But don't do it if you can't call them. Will he call down li uh, lighter after we under up? Probably. But what if we don't even have enough value to do that? Maybe our hand plays better as a, as a bluff on the flop then. Um, how often does he stuff? And really, if we think about that, if he has maybe some kind of equity, he's going to suck out some percent of the time if we check back. And he's probably not going to call down lighter anyway. And really, maybe my hand's not even good enough to value but once checked to twice then aren't we just giving free cards? And, I mean, aren't we really just free rolling his equity? So, really we have to think about, I am making a mistake by checking the best hand when my opponent is drawing live against me. It's not even debatable. We just really accept that truth. I'm asking you to accept that truth. It is a truth. It is a mathematical fact. 
So we need to be able to trade this mistake we're making, not betting the best hand when our opponent is drawing live against us absolutely is a mistake. So we have some downside. We need to be able to make up more than make up for it in upside. If we don't have that upside potential, then maybe we ought not be checking the flop back to begin with. So let's look at some, a couple examples. This would be what I would call pretty much an ideal situation to check back. We have ace two suited and we're in late position, say at a six max table. And we know our opponent tends to be very loose and very aggressive. And we open raise the suited ace. He calls out of the blinds. And the flop comes out ace of clubs, four of diamonds, jack of spades, giving us top pair, no kicker, and runner, runner, wheel draws, uh, and backdoor, nut flush draw. So very, you know, so this would be a spot to me where if I bet against a very loose and aggressive player and got check raised, I would just be so sick about it. I would just be so irritated with myself. And I think a lot of players would just say, like, they would raise pre-flop, they would see that they flopped an ace, they would say, well, I'm going to be betting all the time when I have nothing here, so shouldn't I bet when I have something? And I see the logic there, and there may even be some truth to it, but I'm still going to say no. Uh, that doesn't make pure sense. So if you're going to check back some of the time, this is going to be an ideal check back spot because we don't want to bet and get raised. We think our opponent's maniacal and aggressive. Uh, we would much prefer to just check back and call him. We can very comfortably, comfortably call him on almost probably any turn card. And we can still call him down fairly comfortably on most river cards. And we're going to actually be able to raise him on some turn or river cards which is really going to put him in the cage because that's going to look so strange. Uh, so a few cards hurt us. Some cards help us. You know, turn cards, river cards. Uh, we don't really feel like getting check raised here when we have so much equity. And if we can expect our maniacal opponent to make a lot of bluffing plays, then we can probably expect our opponent to bluff its entire range when we check the, the flop. And uh, maybe he'll even bet his entire range on the turn and the river. So here's a spot where we can probably induce more betting mistakes than calling mistakes. I mean, if we go into value mode here and try to bet top pair for value on this flop and we have no kicker, the only chance of us getting more than one or two streets maximum is going to be if we actually do bink something pretty strong. Uh, so we really can't count on that. And even if we could, it could still come into play when our opponent's bluffing into us too. So uh, we can probably induce more betting than calling mistakes in this situation. We have outs, so even if we have the worst hand, which if we're beat, we certainly would prefer to check back. And here, if we're beat, we have outs, and we don't want to get, we don't want to miss those outs by getting check raised and having to fold a hand we really don't want to fold. Um, we can call two bets pretty comfortably if we know our opponent, and there's going to be, I mean, for sure, the turn. For sure, undoubtedly the turn. And probably if we know our opponent well, we know he's aggressive, then we may even be able to call comfortably on any all, or almost any run out. So uh, there are going to be some cards that allow us to kind of come to life on the river, uh, which is going to really, I think, confuse a lot of players. It would confuse me. Um, so if our hand, um, if our hand's good and our opponent hand, our opponent's hand is bad now, it, it's probably pretty likely to stay that way by the river and our opponent is going to be making more mistakes against our check back than he would against our bat. So that's our ideal situation. We're not scared of that many cards. Um, we're not scared of getting lost in hand. And in fact, we want to avoid being check raised. And we can even be behind. And there's a lot of improvement cards for us. Now this is a non-ideal check back, in my opinion. Um, if we have the ace of spades, two of spades, and we open the button, get called by the big blind, and we go to this flop of queen of spades, seven of diamonds, two of clubs. Now, we could make that same argument that we don't expect to be called by worse hands really ever, and we don't expect to get better hands to fold probably ever. So then shouldn't we just check back? And if not, am I not just kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth? 
I think this is a situation where our hand is actually too weak to check back. And I think that's something you need to really think about. Sometimes your hand is too weak to check back. Not too strong to check back. So, I mean, certainly sometimes it's too strong to check back. But in this situation, I think our hand is too weak to check back. Because if we check back here and we get any kind of really pressure, and we're really inviting pressure when we check back here, if we check back here, I think we're just going to get barreled off this hand way, 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 way too often. So I'm, I think our hand plays much better off in this situation. We have, we're going to just take a, a semi bluff. We've got five outs to two pair or better, and we can hit a, uh, well, we can pick up a nut flush draw on the turn. So we're going to be able to maybe fire some profitable double barrels. Um, maybe like if the ace comes out we can get three streets maybe if the two comes out we can get three streets um, so there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of good things that can happen when we bet but the best thing that can happen when we bet is that he can just hit the fold button uh, so yeah I think our hand is not strong enough to check back here uh, so we might as well just go ahead and bet it hoping that we get immediate folds and if we don't hoping that we improve our equity in some way, shape, or form that allows us to continue in the pot profitably one way or the other on the turn and beyond. Uh, so as we wrap this video up, I'd like you to think on these. Let's say we raised from late position. Let's just say cut off, and we got a caller from the big blind. We're playing six max. He checks the flop. We don't know anything about this player. Do we check or do we see that? And the jack, ten of clubs on queen of clubs, nine of spades, two of diamonds. What are we doing here? And why are we doing it? Um, I think this is very, very clearly a spot that we need to be c betting. And I mean, I, I just, there is no clearer c bet than this right here. Queen, nine, deuce is a hard board for our opponent to have much of. Um, it, even if he decided to get really aggressive against us and check raised us even against an unknown, he's just repping such a small value range that I might even be inclined to just really just put it to him, really, you know, just go over the top and make it make life difficult for his ace nine that he's overvaluing and overplaying, or his imaginary two pair combos that he's repping. Uh, so certainly we want to make a continuation bet here. Uh, we'd prefer to get a fold immediately. If we get a call, that's not that bad either. Uh, we have an open-ended straight draw. We have two over cards against second pairs. Uh, we have, you know, we've got equity. We've got a club could come off. I mean, the turn could be like the eight of clubs, and we'd just be, you know, we'd have the eight, nine, ten, jack, queen with four clubs. I mean, there's a lot of good things that can happen. Uh, we have too much equity to check back, and we have too much fold equity to check back. We don't have a good strong made hand. We don't have enough showdown value to even consider checking back. Don't take the free card, guys. Don't take the free card. I know some players do that. They're like, well, great. I get an opportunity to take the free card. Don't take the free card. Just just bat. Be aggressive. Um, queen seven of hearts on queen three two. I think this is really interesting, too. I think a lot of players would just just absolutely raise this on the button, get called, flop comes out, sweet, I flop top pair, um, and villain checks, and they're just going to bet. Why are you betting? I'd ask him why, you know, if it's, just imagine you're sitting here next to, uh, next to me, and we're playing, you're playing, I'm sweating you, you raise queen seven of hearts on the button, and the flop, come, you get called by the big blind, the flop come, comes queen of diamonds, three of diamonds, two of spades. The guy checks, you bet, and I say, why did you do that? I think what you're going to tell me, if you're like most people, is, well, I'm value betting against uh, 3x, 2x, and I'm value betting against draws. Okay, the biggest, probably the biggest amount of our opponents check calling me, I mean, most times is going to check and fold, uh, almost no doubt about that, but if we bet this flop here, are we really going to be able to get value from those flush draws? Um, and what I mean is, if we don't know anything about our opponent, it's almost become sort of, especially on a board like Queen 3 2, where it really looks like we don't have much of any, that would be hard for us to connect here. Um, I mean, 
we're not going to have two pair combos. Any. And we're not just, we're just you know, very, very, very rarely going to have a two pair combo. Um, we're not going to have a lot of sets just because it's hard to flop sets. And what would you do if you were the guy that called pre flop and say flopped uh, a king high flush draw here? Because I know what I'd do. You know, I would check raise this all day. So if I have like the king 10 of diamonds and I see this flop and I check and the player makes a C bet, I'm check raising for sure. So I think this is a spot where even though we think we're going to be getting value from the diamond draws, I don't really know how much value we're going to get from diamond draws because I don't know how often we make it to the river against a diamond draw with the best hand. Because remember, the diamond sometimes gets there and sometimes we just can't call. So I wouldn't hate a check back here. The other type of hand you're most likely to get called by if you bet is obviously going to be a queen X. And if he's got a queen X, it's almost certainly going to be better than our queen X. So uh, some of those spots are just not that clear cut, but I think you should probably spend some time looking those over, go through them. And um, I mean, definitely feel free to send me your opinions, uh, post questions, um, anything like that. I'd love to hear thoughts. I'd love to hear thoughts about even even the, the, the information I gave out. You know, maybe you have uh, something that you'd like to discuss. Uh, but in conclusions, when should we not see bets? Here are some of your not see bet incentives. Villain's unlikely to call with worship fold better. The flop is static. It's not volatile, so we're very likely to be way ahead or way behind. Uh, we believe we can induce more mistakes than the one we ourselves are making when we decide to check, knowingly check what is likely the best hand. And that's very big. That's huge, huge, huge. And I really want you to think about that. I don't think the question is, can we induce mistakes? Sure, you can do, uh, induce mistakes by checking back and underrupting your hand against almost anybody. But we have to be able to induce more mistakes than the one we ourselves are actually making by checking back this, the best hand. The other thing is we have to have a very clear plan as to why this check back is likely to be profitable. If we don't know how the check back is going to make us extra money, then there's probably not a lot of incentive for us to check back when we are pre-flop raiser. We got called by a player who's out of position. Our, the flop has come out, our opponent has checked to us, we have the decision. If we don't have a good money-making plan for checking back, I think our default option should be to make a continuation bet on most flops most of the time against most opponents. And that's going to do it. So until next time, this is Navinad and good quote luck. End quote.